Hey everybody, welcome to Money Lab Live. It is March 10th, 2021. My name is Matt Givanisti. Welcome, welcome everyone. If you're here, uh, just let me know. Just let me know. Uh, you can also say hi in the comments. Um, if you're listening on a podcast via audio, you're not going to see a lot of what I'm going to see, but that's okay because, uh, and you can't talk to me re in real time. This is why you should be over at YouTube. And this is why you should be watching it live and enjoying the show as it's presented. But either way, I want to introduce my guest, Sean Ogle. Welcome to the show, my buddy. My buddy. Thank you. Remember that old toy? I don't remember that old toy. I think you're just dating yourself because you've got to uh -oh. be significantly older than I am. Oh, boy. <laughs> you don't remember my but my buddy my buddy you nope. can't go that high after that no i i got nothing on that how you doing man dude i'm doing great i'm uh i'm excited to be here it's sunny here in portland which is a rarity in march so i'm in a good mood yeah that is a rarity what do you uh what's it why is it so sunny there's no rain isn't it the reason isn't it in like march the rainy season it's all the rainy season. Pretty much any time from like November through June is the rainy season in Portland. But we've we've gotten lucky. We've had I'm, I can see blue sky. This is a nice change of pace. So cool. I'm trying to soak it all in. All right, awesome. Well, listen, um, we're gonna get started because I uh, I bought these cool note cards. Look at you. I'm trying Always to be analog. On top of the latest trends. I'm I'm yeah. I'm Very going cool. analog. This is this is you know I'm decluttering <laughs> my life and. And not, you know, paying attention to the MySpaces, the Facebooks, things like that. So, um, as we're doing this on, as we're doing this on a on a live <laughs> show. So, I want to ask you, um, the reason I even brought up this topic of organization, decluttering, all of that stuff. The reason I brought it up is because in your 2020 recap, uh, yeah. and you 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 talked about it in your 2020 recap, and then you did a video on what your theme is for 20. 21 and you said that simplify was the thing that you were looking to do and so did say that. you didn't really go into detail in that video so i want to kind of go into detail in this video um yeah when you say simplify what exactly do you mean is it, are you talking about life business or both so all of the above you get to a certain point where like you you know i've you're on going on what 18 years doing this type of stuff probably I mean, like 12 12 years and in that time you basically just have a buildup of clutter like it can be digital clutter with the business as you get more websites and you get dorm, more domains and you have more you know marketing services and tools that you're using and then as you get older and as you have more success with the business then you're building up the physical clutter in your house with all the stuff that you acquire and everything and i just kind of reached a point um, over the holidays where I was like, God, I have got a lot of clutter in my life yeah. and it's stressing me out. And so I was basically like, what better theme than to take 2021 and simplify it, you know, pare down my stuff. We're going to Marie Kondo the house. We're going to take all of like my whole digital world that has gotten very convoluted and try and streamline it as much as possible so that it's easy to understand, easy for me to run and something that I'm just excited to dig into every day. So it yeah. was kind of the idea behind that theme. And for those who don't know, you have three businesses same similar to what i'm running they're all individual websites you have slightly, slightly pretentious.co which is your newest one that's your yeah. um your cocktail website and then you yeah. have your golf website breakin80.com and then you have locationrebel.com which right. is i guess you're like the the equivalent of money lab your online business exactly okay. travel entrepreneurship how to build small businesses all that kind of stuff okay so um how are you planning on staying organized with those three brands, aside from what you're planning on doing with your personal life, how are you gonna take those, like, I mean, you need to stop creating more and paring down right. and sort of like figuring out what's what. So have you? do you have a plan yet for what you're gonna do? So the biggest thing for me is it's con like, I've always li lived out of my inbox. So it's like, oh, I got this email. Okay, I'm gonna use that as like mm. my to-do list. And then, you know, it's one thing to have one business or brand. And if you're first getting going, if you're just starting a blog or a website or whatever, then no one's paying attention. So you can just kind of do things on a whim and whenever you feel like it. And then hopefully it starts getting traction. But Location Rebel has been kind of my full-time thing for a long time. And Breaking 80 has now kind of been a full-time thing for a while. And Slightly Pretentious has been growing. So I've got all of these full-time things. Right. And I didn't have a very good system 
for managing all of that. And so the biggest thing for me so far this year that's really helped is essentially giving myself one place where I can put everything, all my notes, all my ideas, all my plans, all my mm. schedule, all my projects, all my tasks. I had to have one go-to place as opposed to having that spread around a bunch of different services. And so that's really what I've been focusing on over the course of the last you know month or so is to start adopting a service that I can you know, kind of treat as, you know, my online brain, where if it's not in there, it doesn't exist. And I something I can truly rely on. And what is that service? That service is Notion. So you went with Notion. I went with Notion. So I've been using Asana for yeah. a few years now. And I love Asana. Like, I think for project management, it's better. Yeah, thank um, you, Ann. Yeah, <laughs> but... I wanted a place where I can have, you know, more personal stuff. I wanted to put all my writing, you know, do trying to build my daily writing habit again. Um, I wanted some of the database things. Like I've got a cocktail website. So I wanted one place where I can put all of my cocktails. So it's like, if you come over and you're like, I want, you know, a Mezcal cocktail that's strong. I can like go to those tags and it'll pop right up. Um, so I've really been trying to take all of these things that I've gotten, you know, Evernote and WordPress and Gmail and Asana and all this stuff that's spread around and just put them in one spot. And what are you currently key. using? What am I, currently or what were using you using before? before notion? Asana mostly, basically okay. everything was kind of living in Asana. And then my writing, I would, you know, either put in like a Google doc or it would be straight into WordPress or I'd like write something and email it to myself. So I didn't have a one solid place where I could, you know, do everything. Right. So, so. you're deciding to go with notion and that's going to run all three of your brands, right? That's not just like a slightly pretentious thing. That's, that's all three. No, the plan is, you know, Ooh. I'm still working on building it out, but the plan is that it's going to do everything. You know, it's personal, it's business, it's all three sites and anything else that I need. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, obviously, you know, um, if anybody watches who's a fan of the show or a fan of me knows that I liked, I like Asana. I use Asana for pretty much all things. If it's not an Asana, it doesn't get done. That's my motto. And are you like, you basically, I think, and this is, I think, part of what uh, getting things done is all about, right? That that book that everybody references. I forget the author's name. Yeah. But it's like uh, having David a Allen. David Allen. Well, yeah. So having that place where you can sort of like, if you have anything kind of floating in your mind or you have something like kind of just piling up in your inbox, you can just take that and store it somewhere, whether you decide to use it or not. But you need a, some sort of storage place for ideas and to do's and things that pile up and then organize from there, right? Totally. And I think that's really valuable. But one of the things I have realized is you look at a lot of, you know, like getting things done. Like that is a complicated to do list system that almost is creating more work by having to do it. Or when I joined Notion, obviously you've got all these like famous, you know, or relatively well-known YouTubers and people like Thomas Frank is a big one who's all about Notion. So I was like, great, I'm just going to go like grab some of their templates. I'm going to fire that up and I'm mm -hmm. going to be good to go. But again, their templates are so complicated and they require so much input and staying on top of things. I'm just yeah. like, I'm not that organized. And so I had to kind of like backtrack and say, you know what? That's going to be too much for me. I'm not going to do that work. That is not making my life more simple. And so right. I kind of had to develop my own way of doing things. I mean, to that point, you are essentially having to start from scratch because, yes, you can take all of these templates, even, even Asana for bloggers. Like you can take my template, but – yeah. It, when you look at it, you know, we're talking about two, three, four years of and in, maybe in Thomas's case, like a year or whatever, because I know Notion's fairly new, but it's like he's got so many moving parts in his business and he's just and he's got multiple people and the things just keep piling. And they get more complicated because that's what he's into. Right. But right. At, with somebody like you, you just start. And you look at it and it's completely overwhelming because you're like, well, I mean, I mean, you can look at it and say, like, I would love to be able to have this section for doing this and this section for doing that. And then you take those templates, you install them on your own system. And all of a sudden you're like, well, I don't need that. And I don't need that. And I don't need that. And so I think it's like um, back when I started Asana, when I started using that, the reason I started using it was because I had hired one writer. And yeah. 
I was like, I need a way to communicate with this writer that is not in email because then things will get lost. And so it started with, let me create one project, right? And just work with him and create this like system, but slowly over time. And yes. as it as that happened, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And now I can sell that as a process. But even if you start that way, and it's actually the first lesson is like, don't take this whole don't course. Don't copy what I'm doing right no. now. This is like going to be too much for you. Yeah. And so um, does that mean, are you, do you have any plans with managing, like getting rid of things to do? Like as, as far as like stopping work on a, project or a brand or anything like that yeah yes and no this is what i'm trying to figure out and this is one of the problems you run into when you build things build businesses around things that you love so i'm into cocktails i'm into golf i'm into travel and entrepreneurship so everyone's like cool just like sell one of those things and i was like the problem is is all three of those enrich my life in different ways and they make it more enjoyable to do that thing that I love because of all the opportunities that it opens up. So while yes, I would love to be like, you know what, I'm just gonna like stop working on breaking 80 for a while. It's a little bit more difficult to do than just saying that. So what I have been trying to do is really distill down what are the things that I enjoy doing the most? What are the things that I have to do versus what can somebody else do? Um, And what are the, you know, really differentiating between the urgent things that I can do that make me feel like I'm accomplishing something but aren't really pushing the business forward versus the important things um, that really, you know, have high or high leverage activities that I know I can put time into and grow the business. So, well, you know, on that note, what are those things? Because um, I'm, in my notes here, I have double down on the right platform. Are you, and I mean that in, in terms of mediums as well, right? Yeah. So first off, I'm a firm believer where if you start something, you shouldn't go like super wide. So, mm. you know, you started Brew Cabin right. and let's say, you know, a lot of people will be like, cool, I'm going to start a Brew Cabin podcast and a YouTube channel. And we're going to do the Instagram and then I'm going to get on the Twitters and do the tweets and I'm going to have the blog and, you know, I'm going to create a whole course around it. And when you jump into that, you do that right away, then you spread yourself too thin. So you're making like 10% progress on 10 different things versus 100% progress on one thing. And so I'm a fan of saying, okay, you've got your website and you know that's going to be a thing. Pick one other medium that you are interested in and focus on that. So for me with Breaking 80, I pretty much only focus on the blog and on Instagram. With Location Rebel, I pretty much only focus on the blog and the YouTube channel. Um, you know, that might be to my detriment because there are certainly opportunities on many sure. of those other platforms, but it's better to go deep on one platform than really wide on a bunch of them and, you know, not gain the traction you need to actually turn it into an asset and something that helps you grow the business. So that's what, kind of it, what is it for slightly pretentious? Is it just the blog? So I haven't figured that out yet. And part of the question is because I don't care yet. I think that Mm. when, and this is kind of how I've started all my businesses where I'm not worried about making money. I'm just going to start writing because I want to write. I'm going to start creating. I'm going to treat it truly as a side hustle and this thing that I'm just going to do in my free time. And so I started it about a year ago and, you know, traffic's up, you know, I think in, you know, last month we had like 35,000 visitors, something like that, which I feel pretty good about for the Mm. first year. Starting to make some affiliate revenue, uh, halfway decent affiliate revenue actually, and starting to make, you know, a little bit of ad income. And so now it's like, okay, there's some legs here. So the question is, do I want to start a YouTube channel around cocktails? Do I want to start an Instagram account around cocktails? Um, It's probably going to be one of those two things. What are you Uh, leaning towards? I'm leaning towards YouTube. um, But... Why? To really do it the way, because I enjoy the video side of things. And obviously there's okay. videos on. Instagram so not because you saw an opportunity I, there or anything like that. It's just like, it's more based on your own skill set. I think it's based on my own skill set. I've spent so much time going down the YouTube rabbit hole, you know, understanding, you know, the format and how to work and, you know, calls to action and all the stuff in YouTube. I feel like I'm finally getting, you know, to have a little bit of a handle on how that works. Um, and so, and I just enjoy the platform a lot more than Instagram. I like the idea of you have a video that's going to be there for people to watch a couple of years down the road that they can search for as opposed to everything just kind of being immediate with Instagram and then it's well, gone. Yeah, but with Instagram, and I feel like this is sort of something I think about a lot, which is I started Instagram for Brew Cabin, right? Because I, right. I, I, 
I noticed that that's where homebrewers were spending their time, but they're also yep. on YouTube. And if I had to choose between YouTube and Instagram, I'm thinking YouTube one because I can link to things. Yep. Right. I can. I don't. I feel like with Instagram, I know there's video. I know it's like a multimedia platform. It's not just photos, right? But I feel like no one wants to be sold to on on Instagram. You know, like, and I and and also like I worry about the the algorithmic play there where. 100%. What's that? You know what I mean? Like, what happens if I create this awesome video that's like promoting my products and it's, and it's, but it's also incredibly helpful and valuable. And it's like, I made all this, I worked really hard on it. And then all of a sudden, it's gone. You know what I mean? It's like, it's down, it's down some sort of like algorithmic, in your, in your words, rabbit hole where it's, it's no longer to be found. Exactly. And so I've just really, and I feel that way, you know, it's like I create like, a beautiful photo, like golf photos, like this thing is awesome. I love it. And, you know, depending on how the algorithm, and I mean, it's all out YouTube's algorithm based at this point, but sure. Um, sure. With Instagram, it's like, I can have a great photo and there was a shift about two years ago. And this, I see this across so many of the people I've talked to where basically everybody's, you know, likes get got like cut in half for your average post you know you might still have some takeoff or whatever but it was just kind of like overnight we noticed that that was happening so we're like all right well that kind of sucks but i can have a great photo and even if it does really well you know gets double the likes i would normally get in a day or two it's it's gone what does that get me whereas with youtube generally the longer things are around in my case they have ended up being more successful so for instance i had a video called how to start freelance writing for total beginners and the first two months, it really didn't do anything. Um, and now, if you search for freelance writing, it's the first or second video to come up. It's got 140,000 views. And that's one of the primary source of leads for my business. If I had done that same video for Instagram, it would have been gone years ago. Right. Not to mention the fact that I don't feel like people go to Instagram to learn. Right. Whereas they go to YouTube because they are actually trying to learn how to do it. That's something. a good point, too. I didn't even think of that. But yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah, especially if that's the type of business that you're doing. I mean, you're not just an influencer. You're not just an entertainer of any kind. You're trying to teach people. Yeah, it feels like Instagram isn't the place for that. And perhaps well, even like, well, go ahead. No, it's just to say, and you factor in the fact that YouTube is a search engine. You know, what's the, sure. the second largest search engine in the world, whereas no one's going to Instagram searching for things. Yeah, so I think, I mean, ultimately, you have to kind of figure out with your own business, like where you want to put your time and effort into, because there's, there is, there's a plethora of places that you can do it, but you have to figure out, and I don't think anybody's really going to sit there and tell you. I think it's one of those things where you have to sit privately in your in a dark room and sort of think, you know, what makes the most sense for what I'm trying to do? You know, if you're running, in your case, like an affiliate marketing business, right, is, is Instagram yep. right? Is LinkedIn correct? Is Facebook right? I know, like, and, and, and perhaps the mediums in which you promote those things on those platforms differ. And I know that a lot of people talk about the, the whole idea of repurposing. And so in your case, you're taking pictures for something like Slightly Pretentious, right? And you're taking pictures for the website. Yep. Why wouldn't you share them on Instagram? Well, I think that, again, it goes back to how you're splitting your time. At some point, I've now got a bunch of cocktail photos that I will be able to use, whether it's for YouTube thumbnails or you know Instagram posts or whatever. But I don't want to just half-ass it. You don't want to just be like, cool, I'm going to like go into Hootsuite and I'm going to you know create a dozen posts for the next 12 days and just let it ride and do its thing. Like You want to actually build a community in the place where you're doing it because that's what builds trust, that's what builds true fans, and that's how you actually make significant money. Um, so I don't want to just like throw it up and say, oh, it should be here. It's kind of what I've done with Location Rebel. It's got an account. It's got, I don't know, 1,800 followers or something, but I don't really do much. Um, and I, I keep kind of threatening that I'm going to try and take that more seriously. But in my mind, there's just been so much more value in YouTube. So I'd rather double down on that and spend that extra hour or two a day on YouTube than trying to build out a whole new platform. And so you're going to... What about you? Like you've started YouTube recently and you're like all in on like the live streaming. Yeah. What made you choose that over other platforms? Well, with money lab, it made no sense to be anywhere else. I don't think like it, it, you know, Twitter works for a little bit, but we're I'm mostly seeing my peers as opposed to perhaps yep. people who would follow money lab. And I mean, I love Twitter, but that's where I live kind of like as a, 
person, you know, as me, not as a brand. And um, yeah. And so I was like, okay, I'm cool. And this is, you know, I have a Twitter account for BrewCab and a Twitter account for Swim University. But I was like, you know, Twitter for me is like my personal, it's my only social media. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Instagram. I mean, I have accounts there, but I'm not actively doing anything there. And so with, um, with, and in, and same with LinkedIn, like, why would I be on LinkedIn? I mean, are you, I mean, I'm, I'm on it, yeah. you know, I was on it for, for when I needed it, but yeah, I, I've, for Money Lab, the reason of switching to this kind of platform is the discovery engine part of it, because I could podcast too, you know, and yeah, I am, I'm, I'm technically repurposing this and turning it into a podcast. And so it's like, yep. okay, it, it, it seems to, I, I, again, I'm, su- you know me, like I, I'm ruthlessly trying to simplify what I do every day, yeah. right? It's almost to the point of boredom because I've I've stripped yeah. too much <laughs> out, you know, because I have a lot of free time to work on this stuff. It's my hobby. So um, for me, it's like I want to really just work. I want to create really high quality stuff for two outlets per brand. And for Money Lab, it is the blog where I spend a lot of that time, it's YouTube channel. And then I guess email, because I feel like email's pretty important. Yeah, I treat that as kind of a separate thing. I feel like that's kind yeah. of part of the blog. I would agree. Uh, but yeah, that goes back to exactly my point. You have two channels, you focus yeah. on that, and you're going to get a lot more mileage out of doing that than I think trying to have half a dozen different channels, but not putting as much time and effort into each one. Yeah. So, um, Moving on to uh, something you had mentioned in your 2020 recap, and I think you are notoriously bad at this, but you tell me. Um, Notoriously bad at a lot of things. (laughs) Well, aren't we all? Uh, (laughs) Knowing your numbers. Yep. Are you... you, I should probably know those. You should probably know those, right? Marcus Limonis, right? You should should know what, what... you know, and, and Shark Tank and things like that, like know what your yep. sales are, know what your traffic is, all of those things. But um, as a as a means of simpl- simplification, I feel like this is another area where people can, they can sort of have like their numbers in all different areas because you have Google Analytics, you could, you know, buy some other software that has its own analytics, Facebook has its own analytics, Twitter has its own analytics, YouTube has its own analytics. Um, are you sort of thinking about setting up any sort of like one place to rule them all like you do for Notion? Uh, it's something that's been on my radar. It hasn't become a priority yet. You know, Why not? The, when I talked about knowing my numbers, you know, the one thing is I've gotten pretty good at selling location rebel Academy memberships, making affiliate income, you know, getting, you know, we've got a membership site for breaking 80, we've, like making sales. So that's kind of always been my focus but I haven't really gone down to distill, okay, what's my conversion rate on this landing page? Or what's my conversion rate on this email? Or how much did this specific email make me? Mm. And I know there's another layer deeper I can go where I'm essentially treating this as a real business as opposed to kind of a lifestyle business where you're just getting more serious about it all and really trying to analyze and optimize. And it's a fine line because I want to do that because I think I could significantly add to the bottom line by just being a little more cognizant of what's working, what's not and iterating quickly. But at the same time, I have a lifestyle business. I have prioritized doing things in life and the the freedom that this business gives me as opposed to just focusing on the business and scaling as fast as I can and making my business, my hobby. I love, you know, working on my businesses, but I also love, all of my hobbies, all of the things that I like to do away from a computer. Um, And so it's that fine line between, okay, I know I need to be more cognizant of this. I need to spend more time analyzing this, but I don't want to do it at the expense of, you know, all the freedom that I do have. Do you think that if you were to do that, it would help simplify things a little bit more? Because once you know your numbers, then you're like, well, you think so? 100%. It's like, it's a cop out to say, it's like, oh, I don't want to like it, to get in the way of my lifestyle or because really it's just setting up the systems and mm. then those systems are going to make your life easier. Um, and that kind of comes back to simplifying. And for a lot of this is I have to make things a little bit more complicated before they can be simplified by figuring out the right system and the right tools for the right system and how to, you know, this is something you and I have talked a lot about. Yeah. I'm really not good with 
technical side of things. So knowing the best way to track all of those conversion rates and sales and setting up the analytics properly. I feel like I've had four different people try and help me set up my analytics properly so I can see, oh, this is like where all these sales are coming from. Yeah. And it yeah. never ends up being something I can rely on. And I need to just make that a priority and say, okay, let's take the time. We're going to do this. It's going to make your life easier in the future. It's also going to make you more money in the future. So this is something that's important and you need to you know, put some consideration into. Right. Um, I want to talk about um, your strategy for doing short YouTube videos real quick. And then um, okay. after we talk about that, I want to get into Q&A. So if anybody has any okay. questions, I know Susan has a couple of questions, which we will definitely answer. But if you have any questions, please leave them in the chat. If you're listening to this on a podcast, I am sorry. Uh, <laughs> I should probably like maybe send out an email. Out like, if you have questions prior to me talking to Sean about this specific topic, you know, you should you should send in your questions and we can answer them live on the show. Maybe I'll incorporate that. Maybe I have to put that in Asana as a recurring task for myself to do. Well, maybe we can plan this more than the day before and I will send out an email too. We'll have all sorts of questions. You know, Sorry, things, things that like... I do wrong. And and if I, were, if I had my systems a little tighter in place, <laughs> you know. Which is, is funny because for those of you that don't know Matt real well, he might have the best systems of anybody I know. Yeah, look at this so card. Looking for someone to learn from, he's the guy to do it. That's a system right there, baby. Um, oh, yeah. So tell me about the, I've, I've been, I love them. You're doing these um, short. They're they're shorts. You're calling them shorts. Is this is this and this is not a thing in YouTube, right? It's not like a new area of YouTube that I don't know about. Oh no, this is very much a new thing in YouTube. That's not just something I create. <laughs> oh, all right, I didn't know that. This this is a this is a thing. Ew. Um, so you're not familiar with YouTube shorts. Uh, I'm wearing YouTube shorts, but I'm not familiar with the digital concept. <laughs> So for the last six months, maybe, okay. YouTube has been testing out their version of TikTok or sure. Instagram Reels, which are called YouTube Shorts. Um, and they haven't nailed everything with it yet because, you know, basically I create a video, you hashtag it Shorts, has to be under 60 seconds, but it still goes into, you know, my list of all the videos I've made. It also has to be vertical. So it's kind of annoying if someone goes to all my recent videos, they click on it and they're like, oh, this isn't like one of your main videos. It's 45 seconds and it's vertical. Um, but it is also, you know, um, super helpful for being able to create content relatively quickly. Um, you know, I normally try and do two videos a week, but I had a kid two months ago. Um, mm. there's lots going on with, you know, all the different businesses. So I can record, you know, three, four, five of them at a time, you know, have my editor edit them, post them. And it right. takes a fraction of the time as a regular YouTube video. Um, and the, the big quest, what you're trying to do with these shorts is to get added into the short shelf, which is within the YouTube app. And that's how you get significant traffic to these, where it's basically, you know, YouTube saying, okay, we're getting enough click through rates. We're getting high enough watch time. People are interested in this. We're going to promote it a little bit more heavily. Um, I have yet to crack the code on that. I think one of my videos I've done four at this point ended yeah. up in there for about three hours, got a few hundred views and then kind of fell off again. You know, so. I think it makes sense for the industry, right? For our industry of being able to like one tip, you know, here it is in 60 seconds and you're forced to condense it. You know, and I think that that totally. I love, and then and then yours are highly edited. There's a lot of like um, visual, you know, text and stuff happening on screen, and so they they feel like well produced, even though they're only yeah. you know they're short. Well, and I tend to be a rambly person, so I might have a yeah. video like in the like actually all of the shorts that I've done so far are ones that I've done previous videos around that were anywhere from like four to eight minutes long, and so to go from four to eight minutes to 48 seconds where you're still getting most of the value. I think that's great. Not to mention you have kind of an unlimited well of content to choose from. I mean, you could essentially take any top 10 video or 10 tips video you've ever done and create a short around just one of those tips. Um, right. And so the jury's still out on whether or not it's going to help the channel. If it's yeah. going to see growth. Um, but you're, you know, test you're still, testing like I said, it. I'm not a, I'm testing it. And, and it's still YouTube. You it's know, still like the thing that you're doubling down on, which I think is cool. Exactly. And I, the way I look at that is 
I think YouTube wants and Instagram, I think all of any of these social media platforms, they want to see people utilizing all of the tools they have. Mm, so they want to see right. you posting community stuff. They want to see you doing stories. They want to see you posting videos, doing live streams. And the more of those boxes you're ticking, the more you're engaging with the platform, the more they're going to reward you for it. And I don't know if that's true. That's just logically kind of seems how it should work to me. So I want to kind of continue testing out all these things. I'd love to start getting into some of the live stream stuff that you're doing mm -hmm. and just see how it works. Because like I said, aside from the blog with Location Rebel and the website and email, you know, YouTube has been the thing I've gone kind of all in on over the past year or two. And what is your goal with YouTube? Is it the same goal that you have with your website? Is it is it getting email subscribers? Is that it? Yes. So it's interesting to think about because most people, when they, you know, hop on YouTube, they're like, I want to be a YouTuber. I want YouTube to be my business. Well, for me, I don't really care about being a YouTuber. Like, I don't care that much about my subscriber count. What I care about is, am I able to build trust with an audience, find new people, um, and then get them onto the email list? And that has worked remarkably well. And so, um, it's been interesting to see because you're like, you know, I get on average seven, 800 new subscribers a month, which is not nothing, but it's certainly not the like meteoric rise that a lot of people have had. Um, but I get a high percentage of people that click one of my landing pages. I think the, my main landing page converts at 54% right now. Um, and so half the people that are going there are signing up for my email list. And that's where the vast majority of my location rebel Academy members are coming from, which is my and kind of premium membership site. Um, training. Right. And that, and like, so you created an opt-in page specifically for people coming from YouTube. Yep. And are you, um, like, how are, are you directing them there in the video or are you doing it just in the description? So I, I've kind of learned and I've been lazy about it, but when I do a call to action, some middle ish of the video, somewhere between, you know, the one third of the way through and two thirds of the way through Mark, um, I get a huge bump in people that sign up and usually it's only, you know, a 10 or 20 second pitch, but it's like, say it's a video about freelance writing. It's like, Hey, I got a freelance writing guide, go to locationrebel.com slash FWG. Uh, you got a six day course and this guide that is going to walk you through everything we're talking about in this video. Check it out and doing and that, that. Yeah. Um, and then having the link in the description where they can easily go click on it. That is the sole reason I chose, or not the sole reason, but one of the big reasons why I chose YouTube over doing a podcast because in a podcast, there's no easy way for someone to go and click that link and go sign up. Whereas YouTube, that's right. kind of what it was built for in a lot of ways. Um, I have one last question for you. Shoot. How are you limiting distractions in your life to, to work on your business? Or are you, you know, like, I know you just had a kid. Um, I know you are sort of addicted to the phone stuff. Yeah, uh, I am also. 100%. So how are you doing that? Because I have some things that I've been trying. Well, I would love to hear your things. Um, <laughs> honestly, the biggest thing that has helped was having a kid. Where And you might have experienced this a little bit. It's That's like, the hack. For the last <laughs> it kind of is. <laughs> but for the last decade, I have literally had as much free time as I want. I, I can work on whatever I want, whenever I want. And now I'm sitting back, I was like, Tim, what did I do with my life? Like when I had all this free time, um, I got distracted. But now, because I'll generally get on an average day, maybe three to four hours a day at this point to work on the business. So the thing I have done is every Sunday I go through and I schedule like by the minute, you know, this is exactly what I'm going to be working on at this time. And I do that for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then on Wednesday, I kind of say, okay, like, how did that go? Let's reconvene. And I do that for Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, and that has made a big difference because so often with what we do, there is an unlimited number of things we could or should be working on. Um, and so when you sit down to do it, if you don't know what that is, it can be really easy to say, well, this is like the most important thing I need to do, but it's kind of hard. So I don't feel like doing that. So I, I could do this other thing, but I don't want to do that because I should be doing this other thing. Right. And then you just waste all your time on YouTube or thinking about what to do. So by planning all that ahead of time and then saying, as soon as I sit down, I know I've got to do this after that, I know I'm going to do this. That has been 
huge for me. And then knowing that I don't have unlimited time anymore. I've only got, say, t- a two-hour block with which to do it. Yeah. And there is a very <laughs> – a crying baby is a very real deadline or sure. a wife that wants to not be dealing with the crying baby. Right. Um, That's not going to so last forever. That, it's not going to last forever. But hopefully, you know, I can kind of continue this strategy of actually – putting in the calendar, planning exactly what I'm going to do, as opposed to just saying four hour work period. Yeah. yeah. It's too vague. Right. But what about um, you? What are you doing? I mean, for me, it's like, it's, it's obviously I'm pretty good at working. I like, I like coming down here and, and just kind of zoning out and working, but it's the phone in the morning specifically. Like I will just, I will wake up and I will just sit there and just scroll. Like, Damn. um, when I was on Instagram, for brew cabin and I I've gotten off of it now I've literally deleted the app off my phone I I just can't because I just found myself sitting there sort of scrolling and then like thinking I should take a picture of something in my brewery or something to, to share and then like having to constantly think about that but not really ever having a plan and then I was having the same issue with Twitter of just scrolling through Twitter somebody has a tweet I get an idea I it sends me off on a tangent and the same thing yep. with um YouTube, you know, I'm, I'm on YouTube. Totally. I had to unsubscribe from a ton of people because I found myself just like, fu- like seeing a video and going like, Oh, I want to do that. Oh, that's a cool plant he has in the background. Let me go do that for like 10 hours. You know, like it's these totally. like tangents that I get sent on these, these shiny objects. And so like, I just had to remove those apps from my phone and sort of treat my phone as this, like it, a phone. <laughs> like, like, well, and I don't you know. know rotary. Did, did you run into the issue with all of those things as I'm rolling? Like, I'll get ideas and go off on tangents, but then I also go the opposite direction where I start comparing myself to other people that I yeah. perceive as working harder or doing something better. And then it bums you out. You're like, oh man, like I should have done that or I should be doing this or I can never do anything that good. So I'm just not going to do it. Um, that's like one of my biggest problems when you go down those like social media spirals. Uh, I feel feel like that was m- earlier in my career. I felt that more, yeah. but I, I don't really yeah. have like any sort of, I'm not competitive. So, um, yeah. it's really, so I don't really like look at other people and go like, Oh, I'm jealous or I wish I could do that. Or, you know, I don't have that comparison problem, thankfully, cause I know that's a big issue. Um, I, I would have it with like, income you know if i saw somebody like oh they're yeah. crushed they crushed it in this year they did it so well and i look at it go like oh well, how come i'm not you know and and yeah. then it wasn't a, a competition it was more like oh i i need yeah so i guess in your in in what you're saying yes that that is not so much anymore but um yeah it, it's it's mainly now my tangents which is why i stopped reading i stopped reading books because in- i like I, I don't like reading fiction books so much. Like I could, yeah. I, I, I feel like it's one of those things where, um, if somebody tells me that the book is good or it has a good premise and I put it on and or I put it on, I start reading it, and it's like, yeah. oh, it takes me like a week or two to read a book. I'll be so pissed if it sucks, if it ends and it's and it's <laughs> terrible because I wasted you know however many weeks on it. Um, whereas yeah. a movie, it's two hours and I'm like, that sucked. Okay, well I'm gonna go do something else. And so, um, so that's, so for, that's for fiction, but for nonfiction, that's what I like to read. And the problem was, again, I get on these tangents of like, I read a passage in a book and that's like, I'm like, that's a great idea. I'm going to go right downstairs right now, get on my computer and do that actual thing. Cause I am just like, yeah, I need to do it right then and there. And then I realized an hour later. Yeah. What what did I do today? (laughs) Yeah. Or a year or two later, I'm I'm like, shit, I should have done that. You know, but it's because I got sold by somebody or I got, you know, and I am it's sort of the uh, like the information diet. Right. Where you just I just had to like limit all of those sort of distractions because I found that I was learning too much and getting too many ideas. And then instead of sort of like a channel right where I can, you know. Basically, this if I want to go and make a YouTube video, which I'm I'm working on now for brew cabin about, you know, making a Kolsch from start to finish. Well, it's like, okay, now I have the project in mind. So now I'm allowed to, I'm allowing myself to go down the rabbit hole of researching and generating ideas. 
And so now I'm allowed to read a Kolsch book. Now I'm allowed to, you know, uh, watch videos on Kolsch's so that I can develop the thing that I'm trying to develop. But I had to have that plan first prior to just sort of like what's what came up in the feed today. Or, you know, what's the totally. what's the book of the week? What's the habit building book that I need to read? Because everyone else is reading it, you know, like, <laughs> no, you know? Yeah. For me, the thing, and I thought about this a little bit earlier on when we were talking about, you know, kind of copying people's productivity strategies. Mm -hmm. I'll go in and I'll be like, you'll be watching other people and what they're doing and be like, okay, like, you know, I want to learn how to say build a better email funnel or, you know, get more views on my YouTube videos. So then you'll go out and you'll seek out that information and you'll be like, okay, like I'm going to copy this guy's strategy or I'm going to copy this guy's strategy and do this. And what happens is you stop creating or you stop thinking creatively for yourself. You stop saying, oh, what's going to work best for me? I'm going to copy like what that other person's doing. And so when I'm going like yeah. down the rabbit hole of content, you start getting all these ideas and then you start like, whether consciously or subconsciously emulating what other people and are you doing. start doing and things that are not working. Going. Exactly. And it's never going to work for you. So one of the best things I've you know been able to do is kind of taking a step back and say, okay, like, you know, what do I want to do? What do I think is going to be a fit for my brand? You know, you can maybe get some inspiration from other people, but the things that have worked best for me are when I said, okay, like no one's done this, like, cool, that's what I'm going to do. Or no one's done videos like this within, you know, my industry you know, on YouTube or whatever. And that's similar to what happened, I think, with you and your, you know, <laughs> reverse osmosis water video, which took off. You're like, cool, no one's doing videos like this. So, you know, there's no template for it. But because you were able to think creatively, you created something that's really cool that the industry hasn't seen. So, yeah, it's kind and of I a tangent, but something I'm thinking a lot about. No, but I, I think it's true. Like I sat, it's like I said this earlier. Sit in a quiet room, think about your audience, think about your own business, think about what you're trying to do. And, and maybe you're the client. Like I'm a home brewer and I go, yeah. what would I want in the world? And, and, and then go, then you have to seek out those things that make sense for that. And I think, um, yeah, it, it's so funny because I'm working on a sales funnel right now for swim university and I'm sort of like, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working with miles Beckler to sort of come up with this strategy and yep. obviously he's doing it with two different audiences that he works with and, and sort of applying it sort of a, in a general purpose for me. But there are definitely pieces of that where I'm like, you know what? I, I sat there. I don't even have to test this. I know that that part, that little thing yeah. isn't going to work for my audience, you know, but that's yeah. because I've spent so much time with that audience and he hasn't. Yeah. So like, um, it's small little things like, you know, like, People don't in my industry, or at least for some university, don't use email the same way you and I use email, right? We're on email. Yeah, we know when sure. an email comes They're, You know, some of these people are at work and they're, you know, signing up for their free cheat sheet, their free checklist, their free video, whatever, their lead magnet. And then they're not getting to it till the weekend. So they totally. might sign up for it on Monday, but they don't open the email till Saturday or even Sunday. So yep. I'm like, it's not something you can put a deadline on and like, you know, it's, it's just, it's just. You got to know it's different. Yeah, it's just and, different. Um, and as soon as you stop thinking critically about your audience and just start trying to mimic what someone else is doing completely 100%, that's when you're going to run into trouble and things are going to stop working. It yeah. will never work in the first place. 100%. So listen, um, I just want to quickly thank you for joining me, but we're going to get to Q&A. But thank you so much for uh, for doing this, man. I mean, you're obviously always uh, welcome here to the show. My pleasure. I'm just disappointed because you look so much better than me with your like sexy live stream camera setup you got going on. Yeah. Next it's time a I whole, come on, I'm going to need to like, you know, dial this thing in a little bit. It's a whole thing, man. It's, it's, I'm slowly, so this, you can see that the, the light behind me has been getting brighter and darker throughout the entire live stream. And so I'm going to be moving this desk, uh, nope, this way so that the light's in front of me and I'm building an entire set and it's going to be this whole thing because I'm doubling down. On Money Lab Live, I, I like doing this platform. I like producing the show, and I think it's, I think it's. Fun. You look like one of those like fashion lifestyle YouTubers. Like I feel like you should be doing like a makeup makeup tutorial right now. With I that need it. The light like behind you, it's like yeah, just kind of like radiating. It looks great. Yeah, I'm even thinking about doing some foundation work because my yeah, face gets so red when probably, I when I do these. <laughs> you know. So I used to when I was when I used to do plays and stuff on in musicals, I'd always have to wear so much foundation because my face would get so red from the lights and just being in front of people. You never know. Your audience it may be an untapped niche for you. They may love it. Who knows? Like entrepreneurial makeup tutorials for men? 
Yeah, definitely I'd do for it. men. I'd do it. <laughs> no shame. Next time on Money Lab Live. Yeah. So listen, we're going to get to Q&A real quick. We don't have all that many questions, but uh, if you do have questions, please ask them. So we're going to move over to the Q&A section. My dad uh, from last time we did this is in there. Um, this one is from Susan, who is part of Money Lab Pro. Thank you, Susan, for your question. And speaking of Money Lab Pro, if you go to moneylab.co slash pro and you want to sign up, that is my membership community, which uh, is $49 a month. And you can talk to people like Susan and I and a bunch of other people, a bunch of other online entrepreneurs. Sean, you're in there as well. I am. Um, it's fantastic. And uh, all of my courses are available through that too. I have not my Asana for Bloggers course, which we talked about a little bit, uh, an SEO for Bloggers course, really an Asana course for, for, for bloggers or for content development, SEO, YouTube. There's a whole YouTube course in there. Um, yeah. So there's page, there's speed. page speed. Yep. There's a whole course on that. So uh, that plus the entire community and plus we do happy hour every Friday. I forget, we, we, I started with an office hours every Wednesday, but then I did a happy hour last week on a Friday, and that was awesome. All right. I'll have to tune into that one next time. Yeah. Next time we're doing this with like cocktails or beers or something. A hundred percent. So Susan asked, do you guys have your fa any favorite books for getting organized? Yeah. Matt, what's your favorite book for getting organized? <laughs> uh, I did read uh, Getting Things Done. A book once? I read a book once and it was called Getting Things Done. And that book gave me that idea of like having a a sort of place to store everything. Yeah. Um, and that's really it. As, as far as that, like I read Essentialism and the, the one thing, I will say that, the one thing is the name of the book. Um, yep. I really liked that one over Essentialism. And I bought, I, I, I read it digitally and then I bought the book to have on my bookshelf so that I can remember one thing. Um, yeah. And it's not just one thing, but yeah, it's it's a, a way to prioritize and simplify. So that's I would say that's my favorite. Yeah, there's two that come immediately to mind for me. Uh, the first one is The Art of Doing Less by Ari Meisel. Mm. Um, it's very similar in concept to The One Thing, where it's like, how do you pare down what it is you have to do, which has been, you know, I've read it for the second time earlier this year, which I've just found really beneficial as I'm trying to figure out how to do less. Yeah. And the second one is it's a book on organization, but more about, you know, that you can become more organized. And that's Atomic Habits by James Clear. Um, hmm. That book's been everywhere. There's a good chance you've probably already read it. Um, but that has been one of the most practical, applicable books that I've read in a long time um, in terms of just getting a little bit better every day, building better systems into my, you know, day-to-day -day life that is going to make it easier for me to take action on the things that are going to make me more organized. Right. Um, so I, yeah, would I have not recommend checking. All right. I haven't read atomic habits. Obviously everyone's pitching it to me like crazy um, in our little space, but I have not read it again, not reading any books anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I wasn't saying you should read it. I was saying Susan should read it. So oh, yes, of course. Clear. So uh, another question from Susan is how much time daily do you spend organizing, writing to-do lists, et cetera, in Asana? When do you do this? And it's difficult to discipline because it takes time that you could be using to create content or the things that you're actually making. Totally. So for me, this is where, you know, that Sunday afternoon comes in really handy for the week. I try and do all of my organizing, all of my to-do lists. I set aside time on Sunday afternoon every week. Um, that way I don't have to think about it when I'm in my more creative periods, you know, to wake up first thing Monday morning and be like, okay, like I'm going to spend an hour creating my plan for the week. You know, that's one of my most productive times. Um, so I try and do a less productive time where it's like, you know, Sunday I'm relaxed. Uh, I've had a couple days over the weekend to kind of think about the things that are stressing me out. Like, what are the things I want to get done for this next week? So I found that's just a really good time to, you know, basically say, okay, I'm 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever it is for you. Uh, that's a great way to do it. So yeah, I do mine, it. um, at, at the end of every night, if I find the time to do it. And it's mainly because, um, at the end of every night or in the beginning of the morning, I usually sort of, um, so the way I do it in Asana, and I don't know if I talked about this in the course or not, but I have a strategic 2020 or 2021 board. So I have one board with uh, 
you know, like a Trello board or in Asana, like a, you know, a, a Kanban board, I believe they're actually called. And so I have January, February, March, April, May, all the way through the whole year. And that whole board is called 2021. And what I do is I like to have, th that's really big picture, all year sort of stuff. Like, you know, in this month, I'm focused on accomplishing like this main task. So in February, it was creating my first online video course for Brew Cabin, right? And so, mm -hmm. yes, I did other things within that, you know, I do have other recurring tasks that happen, but that month was like, if I got that done, good. And I try to build that out as far in the future as I can. So I, I you know, I'm not a five-year plan kind of person. I'm more of like a quarterly plan type of person. Like I'll, I'll know what I'm doing until the end of March or the end of April. And then I have to go and redo that again. And so that's sort of like, and then the other thing I do is at the beginning of every month, sort of look at what's, you know, what's going to happen. And, and it's, I have plenty of, like, I think I have a lot of time to just sort of like think about that stuff, but most of the time it's creating content. So I don't, I don't so like planning. The thing I, the thing I love about that is when you do it on a weekly basis and you don't have that overarching thing, it can be really easy to only focus on, you know, call it the urgent things. It's like, okay, I've got to write this blog post. I've got to answer these emails. I've got to set up my YouTube descriptions or whatever, all the things that kind of have to get done. But then mm. you do those and you feel productive and you're like, sweet, cool. And then next week you do the same thing and then the same thing. And you're not making room for those really important things like creating a course or creating a new marketing funnel. Right. Um, so I, I really like the way you've set that up for the year. And that's something I might adopt a little bit more. Cool. Um, this other one is, and I think I'm not sure where this was in our conversation, but, uh, were you able to strike a balance from that in the beginning or is this something that you built over time? And I'm going to imagine it's over time. Yeah. For me, I've always done a pretty good job of the work life balance. Like, I'm not sure exactly where this was coming from, but I mean, from like the day I left my job and I don't, don't adhere to this quite as much now but for the first like six seven years i always had a rule that i would choose fun over work so if an opportunity came up that was going to be fun that would enhance my life in some way i would prioritize that over work and i still 70 80 percent of the time hold true to that because those are the thing i'm not going to remember sitting down and writing a blog post but if someone's like hey do you want to go wine tasting this afternoon then you're like yeah like yeah that'll be great let's go do it um and so probably to my detriment like matt is really good you can sit down and for 12 hours you can bang out work and you can do that for five days in a row and then you might at the end of it be like huh maybe i should have you know done something else this week but sure you feel good about the work or whatever yeah i'm kind of the opposite where it's like you know i'll go out and golf or i'll go take a trip or i'll go do whatever and i probably should be spending a little bit more time on the business itself but i've you know i've always had a pretty good balance there I would say that I have a more of a work. I'm more balanced towards work than I am life. Um, yeah. But I, I, in work is my like hobby. So it's really hard to like, yeah. <laughs> I like it a lot. So I don't ever consider it too much of a problem, except when I do get in those flow states that you mentioned, I end up being kind of a zombie afterwards. So it's, I'm yeah. not a pleasant person to be around after a flow state because i'm just like like Good. dead shark eyes yeah. yeah yeah um if you guys were to restart what would you do would you offer uh, lower tier to do it yourself products or would you offer higher tier stuff so i'm a firm believer of this kind of like three-step process so if i was starting over from scratch and i had no job i had no online presence I'd follow this three-step process. The first one is build yourself an online training ground. And by that, I mean building a website. So it could be a blog. It could be a you know freelance services business, but you have to have a way to get hands-on with the things you want to learn. So by creating, say, a blog, you're learning copywriting, you're learning SEO, you're learning the basics of design, you're learning how to become a better writer. Um, that would be the first thing I would do. The second mm. thing is freelance. I would do, become a freelance writer because I think that's the easiest way to start making yeah. real income quickly. Or freelance um, anything, whatever you're good at, right? Freelance anything, whatever your skills are. I think yeah. freelance writing is got some of the lowest barriers to entry because you don't need to know, say, SEO or you don't need to be like a graphic designer or anything. Um, 
And then once you've kind of used that to build up your skills, build up momentum, build up your revenue, that's when you then say, okay, I'm going to start this, you know, more passive income oriented business, whether that's, you know, a blog or a membership site or a YouTube channel or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, because you don't have the stress of about having to make money right away. That's the hard part with starting like a niche site or starting a YouTube channel or something where if your sole focus is monetization, you're going to make some decisions more oriented towards that as opposed to, you know, growing trust or yes. building your brand. Um, so by having the freelance thing, then that kind of says, okay, I've got that to pay my bills. I don't have to worry about making money right now. Just like I said earlier, it's like when I started Location Rebel, didn't worry about making money. With Breaking 80 for the first year, didn't worry about making money. Uh, was slightly pretentious for the first year, didn't worry about doing so it. So you're, like, you're, sure, you're putting more emphasis on doing the right thing for the website because you're trying to build an audience as opposed to trying to monetize it right out of the, right out of the gate. Exactly. Yeah. So okay. it's like, cool, like monetize via freelance because there's a huge demand for it. It's a skill you probably already have a great way to pay the bills. And then if you do that for a couple of years, while you then build up whatever that other brand is you want, you can monetize it in the right way, which ultimately is going to make it a lot more successful than if you just like start from the beginning and all of your posts are nothing but like blatant affiliate posts where it's clear that you're just trying to make a quick buck. Right. So that's how I would start if I were starting over from scratch. Um, I say, I think like if I were to restart, uh, let's say swim university, um, obviously I spent a lot of time in the beginning. I didn't, I don't know if this is obvious, but I spent a ton of time in the beginning with monetization, with, um, just trying to get traffic, shitty traffic, to be honest. Uh, and I think I would have done exactly, well, I did kind of exactly what you did, but much later. So I, ended up doing freelance design work, freelance website design work, while I spent the rest of the time working on doing high quality videos for some university, high quality articles, like really sort of putting all my all into those articles, really yeah. like putting all my effort into the design of swim university and, and speed and all of that stuff while I was making enough money through website design, you know, clients. And yes, it does split your time, but the audience that you're going to grow during that time for your main business, it's an asset. You're building like an an, an asset yeah. that is an, it's going to pay off with time. And then I was able to create a product from that. And I wish I would have created product sooner. And I'm very happy that I'm in the lower tier. And I've always kind of believed in this too. It's like, I know that I could be charging a ton of money for something like you know, I, YouTube for bloggers, which was a course that Steph and I made. It's like, it's huge. You know, we were charging $500, 499 for it. And I'm like, you know, I, I think I wanted to lower the barrier to entry for that because I think there's a lot more value that comes with the long term. And so, um, I'm happy to have things that are more, I would say like lower price, lower tier, but more affordable. Um, but that over deliver in that price range because so, no, continue. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, no. Please cut me off. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't being sarcastic, I, by the way. <laughs> fine. Be that way. Yeah. So I I love that about you. I will say I have kind of taken the opposite approach. You know, I don't really have much in the way of entry level, you know, less expensive products. Yeah, I don't either. Um, I've kind of take it, taken the mindset of I would – it's one from a business perspective. I think it's easier to sell, you know – fewer high price products than it is to sell a large number of lower price products because getting anybody to buy anything can be a difficult thing as you're getting going. So yeah. it's easier for me to sell one $750 product to one person as opposed to 10 $75 products right. um, to somebody else. It also allows has allowed me to spend more time with our members one-on-one -on -one in our forums. You know, if you're getting a bunch of people at a lower price point, then your spread in terms of what you can do from a customer support standpoint, especially when you're a solopreneur, you've got a small team. Yeah. Um, so for me going, you know, the higher price product is something that I actually feel pretty strongly about and has worked out well. Yeah. And I, and I think the bottom line to that is like super high quality, right? Cause like yeah. you're, you're saying you some, you put a ton of time and effort into creating something like the location rebel Academy, right? Is that the name of it? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, I don't know if it was Academy or something else, but like you, you put all this time and effort into making this big thing and like you're charging appropriately for it. And, and that makes sense for your audience 
also, right? It's like thinking yes. about your audience and, and thinking about how you want to spend your time. And that makes sense to me. Um, and for me, it's similar, but I think I put a lot of effort into the quality of it, but then kind of like charge what I think my audience fits better with what their priorities are. Because my, the like, for example, Swimming Diversity is not a product that everyone wants and is like wanting to change their lives for the better. They just want a clear pool, right? They don't, it's, it's, it's their, you know, they're not trying to get better at anything. They're just trying to get a result. The very great quickly. thing about that though, is it's not a product people want, but it's a product people need. need. Yeah. They're like, I need to clean my pool. Yeah. It's green right now. Right. As opposed to like, I want to be able to quit my job and travel the world kind of thing. So. You know, I'm, I, I have a pond now. And I don't know how to take care of it. Ooh, and it's, dime. yeah. And so like, I, pond. I, I want to, uh, if there was like a pond course and I'm sure there, there is, that's like good. I'd be all over that right now, but I had a hard time finding that. Not that I'm saying I'm going to make that business. Cause we're talking about simplification here, but yeah, that was, that's something that I'm just like thinking about right now. But, um, and another, another question, um, and, I don't know how to say your name, so I'm not even going to attempt it uh, to not be to not embarrass myself. But you can see it on the screen, and if you're listening to the podcast, uh, that's it. Um, do you have a weekly routine, daily routine, a routine that you follow, a theme that you follow? Um, I used to do this, and I don't do this anymore, to be honest. I don't really either. Like I okay. by default right now i have a little bit more of a routine because we've got a two-month-old yeah so okay basically like my but wife it's not a productive like, routine no it's basically like between 6 30 and 9 30 every morning i have the baby and yep. then from like 10 30 to like three is kind of my work time but that can all vary i don't really have themes around it so um, here's what i'll say about that because i david lynch who's a famous director produced my favorite television show twin peaks um, or directed it and, and created it. He, um, and if you ever watched any David Lynch stuff, um, you'll know what I mean by this, but, uh, he is a very hard proponent of having a very strict routine. Um, like in, in, in almost like psychopathic, you know, level of, of routine. Yeah. Um, because he believes that when you have routines in place like that, it frees the mind up for like extreme creativity, right? Yeah. And that makes sense because you look at somebody like Obama who had talked about like he he has somebody else pick out his like suits every day so that he doesn't have to make the decision in the morning. And Or like Steve Jobs wearing like black shirt every day. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's my outfit. Um, so I think like thinking about it that way is really cool. But also I think about like, you know, the people that routine and track everything and like, that sucks. That's a sucky life. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> totally. Like, I, sorry, go ahead. No, I don't want that. I'm just saying. I Like, I, I'm not detail oriented enough. Like, that's why I said, like, I got rid of so many of these, like, templates and everything because they were too complicated. Yeah. It's like, I, in some ways, I wish I were that person but I'm just not. <laughs> I would rather think of every day as a new like opportunity, a new challenge as yeah. opposed to being so rigid in your routines that you don't leave, you know, a place for spontaneity, I guess. Yeah. And maybe that's why I'm not extremely creative. <laughs> 100%. So, uh, last question and then we'll wrap things up. Uh, again, thank you everyone for joining. If you like this video, if you like this podcast, uh, you know, do that. I'm not even going to say it, but do it. Uh, and you know what I'm talking about because apparently it helps with our, you know, getting discovered, our algorithm, our views, all of those things. If you're listening to this podcast, uh, tell your friends about the show. You know, if you're if it's something you're interested in and, and you think somebody else would be interested in it, that would be great. Uh, Sean, send an email out to your massive list of people telling them to tune in every single week at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time to watch Money Lab Live. Um, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, pay for ads for me on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube. I'll, I'll do that. I got you there too. You know, five thousand dollar a month budget. I appreciate that. That's that's why you're on the show to to do favors like that for me. I appreciate it. As long as you name a beer after me, I want. Uh, what I do you want it? What do you beer. want it called? I'm not sure yet, but okay. I want a beer because I'm not just going to call it the Sean Ogle. I mean, that's a great name, but I think we can do better than that. That, that sounds like more like a cocktail. 
<laughs> there is a story about how I got the ogle on a cocktail menu at a cocktail bar in Portland. Do we have time? No, we don't have time. Next, next, next show. <laughs> next show. Next show. Uh, last question. Everyday Home Repair says, what is your take on sponsors? I have a YouTube channel with a solid traction, 3 million v- views per month. And I'm debating taking some sponsors, but worried about work. We're worried about the work managing those relationships. Do you have any sort of insight into that? Uh, my thought is try it out. Do one and see how you feel about it. I think it's also a question of how important is the money with your channel. It's like if you have other revenue streams and you're like, you know what, we're making decent like AdSense, we don't actually, you know, really need the money that come from sponsors, then maybe don't do it. But if it if it's a significant number and you feel good about it, then try it out and see how your audience resonates. I think it also depends on what the relationship is with the sponsor. Like, do they want a dedicated video just to the product or can you continue to work it into whatever, you know, content you're already creating where it's like, we've got a video on X, you've got a 30 second segment. This video is brought to you by our sponsor X, Y, Z, and then you get back to the content. Um, but Mm. I would certainly try it out because there's a chance your audience may not care at all and it could turn into a good thing. Yeah. I, I, um, I would, I would agree with you. Just do one, um, and decide whether you like it or not. Cause I could tell you, I did many, many, um, not, n- not on YouTube specific. Uh, no, I did do on YouTube for swim university working with, uh, sponsorships for me is soul sucking because of you're mostly working with a marketing team and they want certain things from you and you have to basically stand your ground and 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 hold on to your ideals and and have those in place before you even do because you're you, it'll be really easy for you to sell out and i mean that like your audience is going to be like what did you just do like what why happened? did you know, like what is this did, did you just make a video because of sponsor you know and it's not not everyone's going to be turned off by that um so know who your audience is um know who you are know what your morals are in that because I know like I I, I stop watching a lot of like homebrewers and other channels who sort of t- constantly their their content is based on who the next um you know who the next sponsor is and I'm just like well now I know this is not this is not coming from a place of uh of you know, it's not even honesty. It's, it's just like, that's just how I feel about it. You know, I think it also depends on how much content you create. Like if you're literally doing like a daily video and one out of every seven is a sponsor video, that's fine. But if you're posting one video a week and then all of a sudden, you know, two videos out of the month are directly related to the sponsor, then that, you know, feels a little disingenuous. Yeah. And, and just, and to the second part of that question about managing the relationships, uh, yeah, if that's not your thing, if that's not what you're into, um, you'll learn that quick because sure. I can tell you that that is, you know, managing relationships in a very regimented uh, way is not for me. I I like uh, I'm more of a casual relationship developer, and so uh, when you have to like follow up with people and and have like that like when you have to put people into a spreadsheet is when things for me start to get a little <laughs> like hairy, and and that's exactly what it is. And, but it's, it can be very lucrative, but the other thing you need to worry about too, is you, you end up on a wheel, a hamster wheel that you can never get off because once you start relying on that con on that income from those sponsorships, you have to keep delivering that or else that money just dries up. There is no like, you know, continual income stream from that. You know, it's, it's a, the other thing I've seen a lot is that a lot of creators have these sponsorship deals throughout, like they'll do it at the beginning of the year. They'll have a year long sponsorship where they're contractually obligated to do X amount of videos and they're burnt out and don't want to create the videos. And so now the only videos I'm seeing some of these creators make are the sponsored videos because they have to do them. Right. You don't want to fall into that camp either. So just kind of be aware of how you're feeling about your content. So, I mean, that's it. Digital decluttering, simplifying our businesses. We can talk more about this in future episodes, but thank you so much, Sean, for joining me today on Money Lab Live. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Say goodbye to the audience. Bye, audience. Bye.